Can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. So the topic for today is Parkinsonism. And I'll, I'll try not to bore you with details and things you already know well. And we'll try to concentrate on less known things. So this is the outline for today. Let's start with the etiology. Here is a quote. And I'd like to introduce the idea that's not everything, not, all that tremors is not Parkinson's disease. And let's find out what is it then. The first thing here is going to be idiopathic Parkinson. And this is, this is the one that's actually called Parkinson's disease. And so this is the one that does not have a, another cause. And it will also have a sustained response to treatment with that information. The one that we're going to concentrate on today's class. But now let's about medication. So, when you find a beautiful drug actually cause Parkinson's, uh, do you recall any? Um, and could you name some medication? Come on, guys. So I guess any that would inhibit dopamine receptors, right? So like antipsychotics and uh, metaclopramide. So you know how would you treat these? Anybody? How would you uh, treat I Parkinson's disease? Yeah, you'd stop the offending agent or the drug. Not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually the first thing you do. That's something that we'll have to we'll have to know very well for our exams. Um, yeah, but something that's uh, that maybe I didn't know when I when I heard about this before is that it can take weeks to months to resolve. Then there are also toxic substances. Different environmental toxins can cause Parkinson's, such as manganese dust and carbon disulfides. And uh, the thing we, we recently mentioned was MPTP-induced Parkinsonism. Uh, I think we had this uh, somewhere along our lines when we were discussing Parkinson's, Parkinsonism a week ago. And the, an interesting thing about it is that there were animals that were induced Parkinsonism with this medication. And so this is how we test new medication, how we test new drugs on these animals. And that's how we actually cause them Parkinsonism in the first place. We use MPTP. Then there is something called vascular Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism. It's pretty interesting. So you see the subcortical white matter infarcts may lead to symptoms that will look like Parkinsonism. And the peculiar thing is that the tremor is actually absent, uh, but abnormalities of gait are especially evident. So. That's why it's also called lower body Parkinsonism. Let me, let me show you a video about that. Gentleman is sitting in the wheel. Let me know if the video sounds. Chair. Okay, how long has it been going on? There is a uh, reasonably normal facial expression and apps. Do you hear the video sound though? Yes, we do. Describe it to me. What, what is actually the problem? Describe it a little bit more in detail. So I'd like to notice that he doesn't have mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the regular What happens when space, you start? If no you can't tremor. get started, what happens? If you're uh, able to start, are you able recently, to continue walking? We just had a Parkinson patient and compare your right hand, can you this patient like this for me? Big to movement, our Parkinson okay. patient. No problem at all. Open and close your hand. Okay. Can you do like this for me? A normal no, Parkinson do. patient would not Heel be able to... Heel-tapping movements do are relatively yeah, brisk bilaterally. It's 18 hours. You never have... Are you going to stand up, please? With so, minimal difficulty, with his arms crossed over his chest. No, but start. Take However, a look. his gait is evidently okay. abnormal. Take a look at his gait. How slow his stride length is very short, very tentative. Yeah. elevation of his feet and you count one two take a look how he's going to be turning okay turn around for me 
when asked to turn, he hesitates, appears to be somewhat stuck to the floor and takes a series of very, very tiny steps to pivot in place. I recommend him that what will be useful for him so to have a laser pointer in his... That's vascular Parkinson. MRI findings are going to help us uh, to support the diagnosis. So let's take a look at this. On MRIs, basically what you need to do is compare left to right. <laughs> and uh, take a look at, for example, this. I think you can see my mouse. Um, how this is this is an infarction in uh, the place of basal ganglia. This I believe this would probably be putamen. And that's what this patient has. He, he has an infarction in, in his uh, putamen. So another another thing about Parkinson, vascular Parkinson's is that the treatment is just supportive and the response to the medication is, is usually disappointing. Now we have post-traumatic Parkinson's. Now, it usually manifests in people uh, exposed to recurrent head trauma. And uh, these are usually people who engage in martial arts and contact sports. They develop a syndrome that's known as chromatic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, right? And it consists of Parkinsonism, dementia, behavioral disturbances, and cerebellar deficits. And you might have seen um, some professional sportsmen develop this, this syndrome. All right. And um, the last bit here is the familial and genetic. And this one, only about 3% of people actually have that. And uh, it arises from like a single genetic cause. It's awful, often difficult to distinguish these from the idiopathic disorder uh, because they both have similar response to treatments. But how would you be able to distinguish it is, is just the fact that the, the patient develops Parkinsonism pretty early in life. And also the fact that there is a familial um, trait of people having Parkinsonism. Uh, the genes are usually inherited in autosomal dominant inheritance. And there are things like alpha synuclein, leucine rich repeat kinase, and, and many other things that I haven't heard about before. All right, now let's go to epidemiology. So what we see here um, is, is the graph made by our Taiwanese colleagues. We can see the incidence on the left uh, and the prevalence on the right. So basically what this graph tells us is that incidence increases with age and there is almost no gender preferences in Parkinson's disease. And uh, just for the reference, the, the life expectancy in Taiwan is eight years. So, and, and the one in the US is usually 78. So a couple of other points is that there are 10 million people in, with Parkinson's disease today. And every year, 60,000 people in the US are going to develop Parkinsonism. And Parkinson's disease is the fifth most common adult onset neurological disorder. So it's the fifth one. Uh, would, would, you, would anyone, anybody tell me which are, what, what are the more common ones? What are the ones, what are the four ones before, that, that, before Parkinson's? What's the most common neurological disorder, adult onset? Would it be Alzheimer's, one of them? Alzheimer's is second, and the first one is stroke. Yeah, stroke, stroke is also considered to be an adult onset uh, neurological disorder, right? Um, second is Alzheimer's. The third one is uh, epilepsy. And the fourth one is uh, traumatic brain injury. And I think we, we can see all these patients in Dr. Bernard's practice. All right, so we covered epidemiology. Now let's briefly go through pathology. So what Parkinson's disease e is, is a proteinopathy. There is this alpha synuclein, it gets misfolded, right? And it aggregates together, making the so-called Lewy bodies. So that's one part of it. The second part is that there's loss of cells and pigmentation 
in Substantia nigra and also in uh, Globus pallidus and Putami. Now, going back to this, uh, going back to this, um, Louis, to these Louis bodies, and the thing is, is the distribution of the Louis bodies is much more widespread than we initially initially appreciated. Look, look at uh, look at all these places that I that I mentioned here. It's basal ganglia, it's brainstem, it's spinal cord, even like olfactory bulb, enteric nervous system, hippocampus, neocortex. And what I'm trying to say is that Parkinson's disease involves the whole nervous system, and it's not just the parts that are only responsible for movements. And this would be a good time to start talking about clinical findings. So we know about them. This is the, the resting tremor, the cogwheel rigidity, increased resistance to passive uh, movements, hypokinesia, which is the most disabling feature of Parkinson's disease, uh, which is characterized by slowing of voluntary movement and reduction of automatic movements like swinging in the arms. Then we also have the abnormal gait and posture that we frequently saw in the office. Now we have non-motor non on the right. And these are the things like cognitive decline, executive dysfunction, personality changes are common. And we also have apathy. We have depression and anxiety. And also sleep disorders like REM behavior disorders. And think about how difficult it is for a Parkinson patient to turn over in bed. <laughs> and things like autonomic symptoms, like urgent continence and constipation, there are plenty of symptoms. Now, it's good to start talking about treatment. Fortunately, we have plenty of medications that are going to help us with, with the treatment. And new ones are being discovered um, let's start with anticholinergic. So the muscarinic anticholinergic drugs are more, more helpful with, uh, with alleviating tremor and rigidity and not so much with hypokinesia. And uh, you probably heard about trihexyphenidyl, benztropine. These drugs are, are best avoided in elderly patients because the effects that they can, the side effects of them, right? Like dry mouth and constipation and confusion. And as you recall in the epidemiology slide, the, the majority of people who develop this condition are actually elderly. So we'll have to, have to look for the majority of the patients for some other medication, maybe like levodopa. Uh, levodopa is converted to dopamine, right? And uh, this medication improves all motor, motor clinical features of Parkinsonism. And uh, unlike the anticholinergic medication, it's particularly helpful against hypokinesia. Now, excuse me, um, there, there remains a disagreement. Uh, well, we're going to get back to this in a moment. There, for a long time, there was a, this, this disagreement about what's the best time to introduce levodopa. For a long time, there was a concern that levodopa loses effectiveness with time. So, Therefore, many physicians would defer the introduction to, of, of levodopa for as long as possible. Um, but this idea is, is starting to be misplaced. And let me, share, let me share this study with you. So there was this study. It was a randomized, delayed start trial of levodopa and Parkinson's disease. It was uh, done by... Um, by, by scientists and published in New England Journal of Medicine. And it was published, published just, just a year ago. So let, let's read through this. Um, to get to the bottom of things, researchers basically conducted this, this huge study. Uh, it was in seven academical centers in Netherlands. And it included this 445 adults with early, early Parkinson's disease, right? In the past two years. And uh, there were two groups. One group started early with the treatment of levodopa plus carbidopa, and they were followed both for, for 80 weeks. And the second group, it was a delayed start group. Uh, it started with the placebo for four, for first 40 weeks, and then they were started on levodopa and carbidopa. And interestingly, the results of these studies showed no significant 
difference. And the, the results were legit. They were using the, the unified Parkinson disease rating scale, uh, the golden standard for Parkinson assessment. And they found no significant, dif significant difference. And furthermore, they also, they also uh, found that the, the rate of symptom progression did not significantly differ. See, what before what were doctors were afraid of is if they give carbidopa levodopa early on in the treatment, in the very first, let's say, year of treatment, that the on-off phenomena and so this uh, time when, when carbidopa levodopa decreases in its efficacy would begin earlier. But what this study had showed us is that there is no difference. And let's, let's see some take-home points from this study. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a very big study. Um, so it was in the Netherlands, no significant difference in worsening of disease severity of early versus delayed starts was noticed. Then the rate symptom progression, the dyskinesias and on-off effects did not differ between the two groups. And also results suggest that early use of levodopa does not have disease modifying effects, nor it is detrimental to the course of Parkinson's disease. And this is actually quite big. Uh, it's, it's a quite great discovery. And uh, I think I've already heard that a Dr. Bernard here in his practice uh, has adopted this way. And he prescribes uh, carbidopa levodopa very early on for his Parkinson's patients. So now we have the next treatment and it's called ablative surgical treatment. And what do you ablate? You ablate thalamus and pallidus called thalamotomy and pallidotomy. It was used before in the past and patients became, when, when, uh, when was it used? It was used for patients that be, who became unresponsive to pharmacological treatment or developed intolerable adverse reactions to the therapy. So after unilateral polydotomy, the rate of significant complications were less than 5%. That's, that's okay. It doesn't sound too bad. Uh, but actually many patients required uh, the surgery done for both sides. And at that time, a moment, the complications could be as high as 20%. So the ablative surgery has now largely been replaced with deep brain stimulation of target structures. And this last, what it uses is high frequency stimulation of globus pallidus internus. Um, why is it used? It alleviates all the motor features of Parkinsonism to a similar degree as ablative surgery. And it also reduces the time off state in patients with response fluctuations. You probably know what I'm talking about. Let's let's look at this at this picture here. So um, it's yes, as you see, it's done by neurosurgery because it requires surgical procedure. And the standard approach is uh, to implant these this, to, to electrode implantation it requires detailed brain imaging before the procedure. And in most cases, general anesthesia is not used and the patient actually remains awake because we need to assess for, for physical, physiological recordings and, and behavioral responses. A burr hole is uh, created in the skull and once the stimulation leads have been placed, therapeutic stimulation can be delivered to assess response in, in tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and when the stimulation lead has been appropriately positioned and tested, it's actually anchored there. So it stays there, stays in the skull with a, with a fixation. And then we also connect a cable that runs all the way uh, beneath the skin in the anterior chest. Uh, and so we connect it to the pulse generator. So, and as you see, this is actually a quite a tiny anatomical stru structure. And to get in, it's, it's, it's not easy. So as you can imagine, this requires high precision and uh, a lot of practice. Now, the next treatment that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about is, is cellular therapy. So the trials transplanting fetal substantia nigra 
to the putamen and caudate nucleus were, were uh, actually um, conducted. And the belief was that the transplanted tissue, tissue would continue to synthesize and release dopamine. And, and two controlled trials involving this, this transplantation were conducted. Unfortunately, both led to incapacitating dyskinetic complications. And moreover, actually, Lewy body pathology managed to spread to the transplanted tissue. So uh, that's, that's on hold. Uh, another <laughs> possible therapy is called protective therapy. This is when we attempt to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease by influencing the mechanisms involved with cell death. Numerous, numerous trials were already conducted and they involved medications that limit glutamate toxicity, inhibit inflammatory responses, anti-apoptotic effects. However, the, the results of clinical study, studies for now have been disappointing. There is one study that's been ha that's happening right now. It's, it's about this calcium channel antagonists called isradipine, and it has neuroprotective properties in animal models and Parkinson's disease. And um, it's, it's currently underway, and we will find out um, what's the result of the study in, in the upcoming future. So as with many conditions in neurology, numerous novel treatments options are in development, and uh, it's up to us to do our best to be informed about them. Thank you.